Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas, everybody. It is the Christmas season, and it is Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. That means it's time for that effing morning after show with me. You know Adam Holtz is going to be here. We got tons of stats for you. We're going to talk about last week. We're going to set you up for the next week. Yes, we're going to talk about the Kansas City call because we got to, but we're going to have a lot of fun. We're glad you're here to join us. Let's get this thing started. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. How you doing on this Tuesday morning? I don't know if anybody caught the games last night. I considered both kind of a surprise. Um, it worked out 50-50 on our predictions. We'll get into that. Uh, we'll talk about this week that we just had. Adam, welcome back to the show. Stuff's getting crazy. NFL playoffs around the corner. The NFL is... You know, the playoff picture is, I was going to say shaping up, but it's honestly as cloudy as ever. Um, and we're going to talk all about it. Good morning, my friend. Yeah, I mean, there's log jams in both conferences now, right? Like for those wild card races, like the division races aren't all that dramatic right now, right? Like it's not about the divisions. It's those wild card spots. And there's a giant group in both conferences fighting for those last couple of spots in the playoffs that it's going to be a fun final month of the season. Insane. It's, it's good. No, it's going to be really good. You're absolutely right. Part five, I like to call it. Um, and I'll explain that later in a little bit as we go. Um, I kind of break the season down. And when we get to the stats, you know, the first four weeks, eight, 12, 16, and then you got this last stretch. Um, but it's really part It's Four parts because there's 16 weeks. We'll get into it. I'm not going to confuse everybody yet. Uh, let's get into the record watch. Let's talk about how we did at the beginning of the year before it ever started. All right. As you guys know, before the season ever started, me and Adam, every team, every game, we broke it down. We already know who's going to the playoffs because we broke all this down for you. So, you know, we play along, but we've actually got all this done uh, already. Uh, isn't that right, Adam? 100% accurate. Uh, we're pretty close. I got to say, we're actually pretty close. We actually kind of are. We'll get, we'll like get you're not being that. too sarcastic when you say that. Like, it's been uh, pretty accurate. You know, the, the, the numbers are a little off, but... The, one, the teams that are there at the end, pretty close. This week, I went 7-8, uh, and eight, so I have another losing record. Uh, you went 8-7. and seven. You pulled it off the positive win, even though it was kind of split. The NFL in general had nine home, nine home victories to six visiting victories, and that puts 115-92 to 92 for the home team this year. I am sitting at 125-83, and 83, not Bad, you are sitting at 130 and 78. Your lead just kind of adds one, adds one, adds another one every week. Uh, and you are five up on me now. Uh, the Carolina New Orleans game is one that we split. And then the thing that's hurting me is we agreed on so many games. There's only like one or two splits every week, and you seem to be getting them all. Not that I should really be surprised about that, but that's where that sits so far. <laughs> Well, you know, there's usually a good amount of games on the schedule that are, I'm not going to say easy, but have like a team that should kind of win, right? Especially when yeah. you're looking at it before the season starts. Now, like if we were adding point spreads into this mix, this would have been a whole crazier thing. And I can promise you our records wouldn't be as good as they've been. But even with just picking the game straight up with where our record sits, it's been pretty unbelievable how good the records are. Yeah. I have noticed, though, that over these last few weeks, we both kind of come back to earth a little bit. You know, yes. like those like 11 and 12 win weeks that we were churning out seemingly every week for the first half of the season. There's been a lot more weeks around 500 lately. And we're going to see that in the fantasy numbers as well. If we break down the stats this week, you know, and, 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 you know, I break it down by position and show you guys the numbers. We're going to see how part four uh, of this fantasy season, that's weeks uh, 12, 13 through 16, are much different in a fantasy perspective. And you just brought it up from the NFL perspective, but also from a fantasy perspective. We've got a lot of new faces 
on the list this week, on all the lists this week. And honestly, we have a lack of consistency across the board at every position. Um, it's very interesting to look at. I hope you guys find it as interesting as I do. I'm kind of a numbers geek on these things, but I think you're going to like it, Adam. Uh, let's get into a couple numbers right now. You see up there in the corner, this week we had 41 pass touchdowns to 27 rush touchdowns. Now, last week we had 29 rushing touchdowns, so not such a big deal, but we only had 23, I believe it was. Uh, 25. Last week we had 25 and 23. This week it's 41 pass touchdowns. Uh, that's quite the uptick, a 16 touchdown uptick compared to last week. And then there was also six more uh, from the special teams and defense this week. That brings the total to 74 touchdowns that your fantasy folks could have banked in on this week. What do you think about that really ginormous shift, that very significant shift in the passing touchdowns, Adam? Well, like I think, you know, matchups are always going to have a lot to do with it, right? Like, you know, which of like – the good quarterbacks are in like higher scoring games and against defenses that can allow, you know, some passing type of numbers. Um, matchups always important when you're looking at this kind of stuff. So like, I'd say it's probably mostly a product of that. Yeah, I, I can get down on that again. And I think we're going to see that when we talk about these numbers and people showing up in the top 10 that haven't really been there before. And then the people that have been there uh, struggling in this, sec in this last, quarter of the season um, and we'll see those numbers kind of show that as the show goes on we're going to get into the rewind because that's going to get us into those stats so let's talk a little bit about what we just saw over the weekend fantasy rewind we bring that to you uh toilets sorry trophy toilets I'll get this right. Toilets2titles.com. Go over there. Check those guys out. They've got some amazing fantasy football content going on. You really want to get on the Discord. You want to get on the Gilded app and get on their Discord because it's just fantasy analysis and, and, and experts and breakdowns just all week long. They've got a lot of good stuff over there. Go check them out. Uh, Toilets2titles.com. All right, Adam. Uh, last week, before we get into the actual numbers of the games, what were some of the things that you remember seeing? What sticks out in your head from last week? Well, I mean, let's talk about the obvious one, right? The Dallas Cowboys finally <laughs> show up this one. week in a big spot, in a big game with the whole world watching. I touched on it last week that I was confident in my Cowboys going into that game, but also acknowledge the fact that these are the spots where they usually let you down the most. In the biggest games and the biggest moments against the best teams, the Cowboys usually crumble and Dak usually plays his worst football. That's unstoppable right now. He's been absolutely unbelievable. I saw a stat that since week six, he has 24 touchdowns and two interceptions since week oh. six. It's ridiculous. His last last six games, his last I mean, absolutely ridiculous. He's playing lights out. I understand why he's in the MVP conversation. I can make arguments for a lot of people, but he definitely has to be there. Good morning, David. David is regular to the show. He says, morning, fellas. Almost over this dang segment. He's feeling a little under the weather, but uh, his fantasy seasons have been making him feel a bit better. I tell you what's what's keeping him down is the fact he's a Steelers fan like me and so he's had to deal with uh losing to these teams that we should not have to lose to. David, feel free to chime in on what you saw this week that uh really got you excited or got you uh that you remember significant moments of this weekend if you will. And yeah, uh you're right Adam Dallas, the, the thing that I was watching with looking for at that with Dallas is that Dallas at home has scored 40 plus points in every game. And then in comes this uh, Philadelphia defense, which really was tops to the tops in a lot of categories uh, against the run. I said, don't play Pollard this week, uh, which kind of was true. Pollard did not make the top 10, spoiler alert. Um, well, they've been and, a polarizing defense, right? I think well, they, they were like they, yeah. number one against running backs and dead yeah. last against quarterbacks or something like that. Well, in the middle of the field, they brought it up during the pregame for that that one. The middle of the field has been wide open for those guys. Um, and, you know, 
Dallas didn't, I don't, they didn't put up the 40, right? So that, that streak uh, goes down, but they still get 33. They still win by 20. And you're right. They win in dominating fashion. Um, it was, it was the game, you know. Both, and let's both. remember too, that Jalen Hurts in that offense did not score a touchdown in that game. Their only touchdown was a defensive touchdown. So it was both that. sides of the ball for the Cowboys. Defense completely shut down their offense and Dak absolutely picked apart their defense. Absolutely. Yeah, I had to bring it up, David. I did. I'm a Steelers fan, too. You know it. Uh, at least you still got that team up north uh, having a shot in your college prospects. Um, another game that caught my attention was the Baltimore win. That Baltimore win was really big for Baltimore. Um, mm. And and the Rams were able to move the ball all day. And, it, and that was significant as well. What, the Rams caught my attention because that Baltimore defense, which is considered one of the best in the league, was not able to really do anything against the Rams. Uh, and, but the Rams defense wasn't able to do too much either. They get it to overtime and Baltimore ekes out the win uh, in that one. But Lamar's 316 yards was absolutely amazing. Uh, he is back in the top 10. We'll talk about where. But that game really caught my attention with – with how their defense was susceptible. And, and I had to say for the Tennessee Miami game as well, Miami's Achilles heel clearly is their defense and it has kind of been that way all season. Yeah. And you know, like the numbers say that Miami's defense is good, but when you watch them, they kind of get beat up a lot. And like, they're not great when teams go right at them, you know, yeah. that power running game type of deal that like the Titans do that's been kind of an issue for the Bronx, I mean, for the Dolphins all year long. I like what you said about the Rams Ravens game, but like to me, it's another reminder from a fantasy perspective. How good is Kyron Williams, man? Like, even against this elite Baltimore defense, he still did his thing. He still looked like he was playing any other defense, and the Ravens have shut, you know, like just about everybody down this year, but they couldn't even slow this kid down. He's the real deal. When we break down uh, in, in the next next week, next coming couple weeks, uh, when we start breaking down the fantasy leaders and stuff, we're going to see a lot of the new guys up at the top, a lot of the first, second-year guys up at the top this year, um, and he is definitely one of them. You're absolutely right. Uh, David, learn never to bet against the Giants in an Eliminator League. Every one I was in this year, I got knocked out choosing the team to beat the Giants, and we've been kind of touching on this all year the Giants have sucked and we knew that they were a fraud uh, a fraud team and then DeVito comes in and I is DeVito 3 and 0 right now uh, he's won 3 in a row I think he's 3 and 1 I think is what it is yeah three in uh, a row. but three I mean he looked spectacular I kind of had a feeling that the Giants were going to win that game last night I just yeah. had one of those gut feelings that the Giants at home, Monday night football. You know, the Packers have looked good lately. They're, they've been kind of rolling. The Giants are kind of fighting their way back into a playoff spot, too. I saw a crazy thing about the Giants that uh, before that game, if they won the game like they did, they're one game out of a playoff spot. If they what? had lost the game, they'd be one game out of a top five pick in the draft. How about that? that that's how it is in the NFC, though, right? Five Crazy. wins has you in the hunt. And then so yeah. technically, technically, five wins still has you in the hunt in the AFC as well. Uh, and, and we obviously, I mean, the Giants are one game now, and they just got a head to head victory against the Packers, which are an important team in this wild card race as well. It's huge, but you got one, two, three, four, five, six, six teams with six wins, and there's only mm -hmm. five teams above those. So five yep. is still in there with four games left to go. It's maths, everybody. It's a little early for Crazy, you. Right? There it is. Um, any other games that kind of stuck out with you this weekend? Obviously, Pittsburgh losing New England. That was kind of uh, significant in, you know, uh, Pittsburgh. Well, I mean, let's talk about the other big one then, too, and it's the Buffalo Bills getting a win against sure. the Chiefs and keeping their playoff hopes alive as well. Them getting that victory gives them a much better chance of getting into the postseason, you know, you can see it by their probabilities and their likelihoods and all, you know, those like stats that generate the probability of making it. That changes just about everything for the Bills. Like, 
they have a really good shot now to get in the playoffs. Had they lost to the Chiefs, it would have been a big uphill battle because the Bills' tiebreaker situations are not so good right now. And it's just a reminder again, too, that though the Bills have kind of struggled this year, you know, unlike what I said about the Cowboys, Josh Allen always shows up for the big games. Minus that Bengals playoff game last year, all the big games, look at Allen's numbers in big spots. He always shows up when he has to. So he's a guy I'm watching. Oh, yeah. And, like, he's a guy I'm watching for this last month of the season. Put Josh Allen back against the wall and say, you got to go out there and win now or we're not making the playoffs. He yeah. showed he can do that against the Chiefs in this little last stretch of the season. We might see Allen go crazy. Yeah, and the Back It Up Binge Podcast, uh, welcome to the show. Absolutely 100% what I was going to bring up as well, that Finn's loss. Big Bill's win keeps him in the hunt with that terrible Finn's loss. That The couple there. It True. definitely helps the Bills' chances. You know, the, the Dolphins really well, are and the Bills in trouble, already but... beat the Dolphins heads up. It, yes. In their first meeting, the Bills beat the Dolphins, and they get to play them again in Week 18. So that's spot on accurate. It's going to be interesting because Allen has caught so much crap uh, for the past few weeks. And if this keeps up, he's – you watch, you watch the media flip, how fast they flip, and Allen will be the golden boy that he really has been all season. They were looking for a reason to come down on him. Um, and they, you know, he get they get he got one. They got one. But statistically, fantasy wise, and at the end of the season, we're gonna see why he's on the cover of Madden. Uh, again, keep those comments coming in. Let us know about the games, the things that caught your attention this weekend. Here's some things that caught my attention. You guys are gonna love the stats this week, all the way through. I, they're 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 phenomenal. They're just mind blowing stats this week. Here we go. All right, first stop, the QB room. Oh, let's get rid of that little logo. Can't have that in the way. Sorry, bud. There we go. All right, week 14, Evan Facts about QBs. Now, this is all QBs in general. This isn't just the top 10 list, okay? But um, I, let's just get into it because it's a lot of fun, okay? <laughs> uh, here we go. 34 quarterbacks played this week out of 32 teams we had a couple substitutions had a couple of injuries only 26 of them threw touchdowns so that tells you the state of the uh, the quarterback position nowadays six quarterbacks ran one in and five of those six we're going to talk about versatility versatility is going to be a big thing between quarterbacks and running backs this week as it has been all season but you're going to see it in the stats um five through three touchdowns we talked about uh, you know, Zappy last night, five had three, four of those made the top 10. Everything's not touchdown dependent guys uh, in fantasy. Uh, we'll talk about similar thing with running backs as well. Number one in pass yards this week, Adam, who's number one in pass yards? Give me your best shot. Oh, Adam's getting coffee or I have him muted. One of the two. He's got himself muted. All right. Adam's getting coffee. I'll tell you who it is. Uh, <laughs> it is none other then Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy comes in at number one in pass yards. Yep, you read that right. It is indeed Brock Purdy. Uh, he had a great game. Fantastic game this week. Uh, a big win against Seattle. Came through as he has been. You know, did what he needed to do. He usually isn't the yardage leader, but there it is. Uh, he's, he's coming into his own. You know, there you go. Number one in rush yards. Rushing yard QB. It's not who you think. Yes, it is. It's Lamar Jackson. <laughs> yeah. Lamar Jackson is the number one in rush yards this week. Number one for interceptions. You got a guess for number one in interceptions? With mm, number one in interceptions. I don't know. Here's the interesting thing. He also threw three touchdowns. He had three touchdowns, but he also had three interceptions. He's the guy that didn't make the top ten list. Is T Law? T Law did not have a great game. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and that's a finish. Yeah. I mean, he throws three touchdowns. You can't argue with that, but and as a result, he doesn't make the top ten. And number one in sacks. Who can, who's your number one sack guy this week? Which quarterback just got railed? Well, it wasn't Zach Wilson, even though he's been getting sacked all year. And Sam Howell didn't play this week, so it couldn't exactly. be Sam Howell. So I don't know who it is then. It is a Those guy are usually your two. who Those actually are usually got... your two. Oh, Bryce Young? No. Oh, nice guess. It's actually 
Josh Dobbs, which is one of, one of the mm. reasons they benched him. The, you know, you say you got benched because of his performance. What an ugly game that was. Jesus. Yeah, it was. But you got to think at some point, got, kid's getting hit five times. He's the only quarterback we got left. Let's pull him out. <laughs> Let's pull him and see, make sure we don't end up in a brutal situation. Number one in pass percentage, 75%. This will blow your mind. And I know percentages can be skewed. They can. But this is going to blow your mind. Number one in pass percentage. There's two guys. <laughs> You're going to love it. Jake Browning and Zach Wilson. Those are your top two pass percentage guys for this week. Mm. Love it. Is that Six Zach Wilson balled out this week. Balled out this week. Best game of his career. We probably should have brought that up. Uh, that should have been a notable moment in our heads. Six quarterbacks had plus 300 yards, but only four of those made the top 10. It's these things that you think, you know, getting 300 yards, that should be an automatic top 10 guy. Getting three touchdowns, that should be an automatic top 10 guy. It's not. It's you got to be versatile. you got to get the rushes in. Uh, now, now we're getting into the top 10 list. You needed 21.3 points to make the top 10. That was 1.6 better than the average. Uh, you need a little bit more this week. Seven quarter, seven of your top 10 quarterbacks won. Three of them lost. We've been talking for weeks about how losing actually helps you make the top 10 list in fantasy. Five of the 10 had a rushing touchdown. We talked about that. Eight out of the 10 had two or more sacks. So even though you get sacks, as long as you uh, you know don't get out of control with it, only three were here last week. These are the kind of things that are going to blow your mind throughout this entire show. Only three of these quarterbacks, three of the top ten quarterbacks, were here last week. And all ten had two or more TDs and had one or less interceptions. So you talk about you, you've got to be consistent. You've got to get the job done. These guys did it. Five ran it. All of them had two or more touchdowns, and they all have one or less interception. That's what it takes to get on the top ten list. So who made the top ten list? Let's get after it. Oh, yeah, three. Three new additions to the top ten list. 39 quarterbacks have made the top ten list this year. Let's get into it. Number ten. I love this list with three new people on it. Joe Flacco comes in at number ten. Falco is back. He's at number 10. Look good doing it, too. Josh Allen at number nine. Sliding a little bit, but still had a good game. Mitch Trubisky comes in at number eight. Despite how bad they played, Mitch Trubisky is on the list. And saying Billy Zapp, Zappy is on the list against my Pittsburgh Steelers. So both those teams, and for to see who sucked less, uh, make the top 10 list. Brock Purdy, we talk about your, your yards leader. But he's only at number six. Even though you lead in yards, you think that puts you? No, it does not. Uh, Matt Stafford. Matt Stafford at number five. Jake Browning comes in at number four. How lucky are the Cincinnati Bengals to have this guy showing up? Uh, Justin Fields at number three. Love, Got to love those rush yards. Desmond Ritter at number two against Tampa. Tampa's defense is not, you know, the, I'm not calling them like the best on the field or anything, but they haven't been horrible. Desmond Ritter, uh, and we know why. We'll talk about that later on as well. We understand the quarterback wide receiver relationship with these top 10 lists. Uh, so you can piece that together. And Adam, who is the number one quarterback in fantasy this week? There's a Lamar of Jackson. It is indeed Lamar Jackson. There he is. He finishes at number one. Look, ran ran him in, had more than uh had two or more, one or less interception, top in yards, uh, not number one, but up towards the top in yards. Complete game. That's what it takes to get on the list in fantasy. Um we're going to see it's not that way for all the positions, but for this case, it absolutely is. Uh, Adam, what do you think about what we just saw with these quarterback stats? And what do you guys out there uh, think with these quarterback stats? I mean, I was loving it from Lamar and Fields this week. I have shares yes. of them in a good amount of leagues. Uh, they definitely helped me yes, out this yes. week. Desmond Ritter, definitely an interesting one. And he's a guy that – He's been very polarizing this year. He has a couple of top tens, you know, yeah. like a lot talked about how bad Desmond Ritter has been. And this is one of those things, like from an NFL perspective, Desmond Ritter has been very bad and is very bad. But from a fantasy football perspective, in super flex leagues, in the right matchups, he's been not just serviceable, but pretty good. It's, it's, and, I don't know. Like, do you have him in fantasy matchups, though? 
I don't know if you put him in fantasy matchups. I don't know how you put the guy in. I mean, to, you know, to be fair, he hasn't had a lot of appearance. I think this is his second appearance on the top 10 list all season. So it's not like something you're going to necessarily predict. It's not like teams are blowing up Tampa Bay or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely a tricky one to figure out. He obviously got benched in the middle of the season as well. I mean, I think he's been a little bit better, you know, since coming back. Not even really coming back by choice. He came back because of an injury, right? Uh, so, you know, just interesting uh, kind of to watch. And it's it's the rushing upside that we always talk about, right? Absolutely. You know, like he can run the ball. He grabs some rushing touchdowns here and there. And when he's getting the rushing yards, these mobile quarterbacks like that, especially in Arthur Smith's system, you know, like he can have some pop weeks. Uh, the other thing that just astounded me, only three were here last week. We're going to get into that when we get in uh, a little later in the show. Um, but only three were here last week. You talk about the ink, the, the inconsistency in this part uh, four of the season. A uh, lot of new faces and they pop up every week. You can stream. You know, we talk about drafting the zero RB strategy. It's, it's, <laughs> it's almost getting there for the quarterbacks as well. Uh, just, Take wide receivers and then go from there. Uh, it, the numbers are just you, you won't you won't believe them uh, as, as we go through this show. And I queue up the next round at running back. Um, so let's go ahead and hit the running back position. All right, here we go. Running back facts. This is facts for all running backs this week. Again, a lot of uh, oh, sorry. A lot of uh, brain teasers, brain blasters here. Only three running backs went plus 100, and only one of those made the top 10. If you on the Instagram, if you're on the, the uh, X machine and all that, you'll see uh, I did a piece on this last week. Last week, Joe Mixon was number one, only had 68 rushing yards. You do not have to get 100 yards. You do not have to lead in yards for your running back to be relevant in fantasy anymore. And this is kind of what feeds into this zero RB strategy, uh, I think, when it comes to the draft. 15 running backs had rushing touchdowns. Only three had multiple touchdowns. Nobody had multiple rushing touchdowns, all right, uh, well, until last night. Last night we had uh, two with multiple running touchdowns. Two of the multiple touchdown uh, running backs made the top 10, all right? So we're going to see how that all plays out in just a second. It's going to become clear. I know it's a little foggy right now, but it will become clear when we get into the list. Five running backs caught a touchdown, and all five made the list. This is the things that we've been talking about for a couple of weeks. This is how the running back position is more than just running, and honestly, it is the receiving backs, just like the quarterbacks. The quarterbacks who can run them in, the running backs who can catch them and take them in are the ones – that are setting up your fantasy wins this year. Uh, five running backs had 70-plus receiving yards, and four of those made the top 10. Again, showing how you need that all-around back to be successful in fantasy. Let's talk about it. Number one in rush yards, CMC. I can tell you right now, did not make the list for like the second or third time all year. Did not make the list, but he's your number one rusher. Why? No touchdowns. You got to have put together a complete game. But he was number one, 145 in the rush room. Receiving yards, Tajay Spears comes in at your receiving yards. Not who I would have, you would think it would be CMC or something like that. No, it's Tajay Spears. Also did not make the top 10. Didn't have the fully balanced game. Uh, next, number one in attempts. That volume, RB7 made it. And then Kyron Williams. Both of them had 25 carries with the ball this week and number one in those receptions ended up at RB2 because he had the complete game RB2 number one in receptions let's talk about what it took to get on that top 10 list this week you needed 19.5 again you needed a little bit more this week than in previous weeks five out of the 10 did not have a rushing touchdown we are talking about the running back room ladies and gentlemen five of your top 10 did not even have a rushing TD. We talk about diversity. We talk about receiving backs. Look, the evidence just keeps piling up, including your top three. No rushing touchdowns for your top three, five altogether. Five out of the 10 had receiving touchdowns. We talk about that. Eight out of the 10 won. A little more lopsided here. Eight out of the 10 came out with a victory. Only two had more than one touchdown. 
Only two of your top 10 running backs had more than one touchdown. Only one of your top 10 went over 100. We talked about that. Cincinnati had two make the list. That's how that game went. 46 running backs have now made the top 10 list because we added two more this week. Oh, and only two were here last week. Only three quarterbacks made uh, from last week made it again. To be fair, Allen was on the bye week. Only uh, last week. Last week he was on the bye week, so he couldn't string these together. Uh, only two running backs on this week's top 10 list were here last week. We got eight new entrants compared to last week. Not rookie entries, but here we go with your running back top 10. Are you ready, Adam? Here we go, number 10, Chase Brown. Chase Brown makes it. We talk about how important receptions are. Kid only had three. Good enough to make the top 10. Would not. Nobody saw this coming. Nobody did. Don't From out of nowhere. From out of nowhere. Nobody played him in DFS. Nobody played him. He got zero plays. I'm telling don't lie to me and tell me unless you're like in a 32-man league or something. Bijan Robinson comes in at number nine. Uh, Austin Eckler, welcome back at number eight. Rashad White, he's your 100-yard rusher that made the top 10 list this week. Joe Mixon, he's back, falls from number one to six. He's up back on the top 10. I told you only two guys did it. He's one of them. Raheem Mostert, welcome back to the list. Although, honestly – Two touchdowns is good. Uh, I expected more out of his position this week. Saquon Barkley falls in the end zone a couple times, falls into the four spot. James Cook, welcome back to the list. I mean, the guy hasn't been here forever. He finally gets on the list uh, in a game that maybe you wouldn't have expected him to be on the list. But Kansas City softer on the run than they are against the pass. Number two, Brees Hall. He was your number one in receptions. Ends up number two on the list. Any uh, ideas at number one there, Adam? Number one was I was gonna say it was Rashad, but he's lower than I thought. Oh, um, come on, no, There's some clues on the board. There's some clues on the board. It is. Hmm. It's escaping me right it's now. It's your boy. It's oh Zeke. my goodness! Zeke. How did I forget? In the top 10, that's I forget? number one. Huge game against a team you're not supposed to be able to run on, against a team that's supposed to shut it down. Zeke Elliott at number one on your list this week. It's got to make you feel good. It makes me feel good as a Buckeye. I know it makes you feel good as a Cowboy. There's still love for Zeke. He gets his shot with the Ramonde injury, and he comes through number one debut on the top 10 list. Zeke Elliott. There you, you know, go. I absolutely love that Zeke ball out this week and it wasn't coming to me because like when I'm going through everything like my brain just keeps going to Sunday I'm like who am I missing who am I missing who am I missing it was Zeke from Thursday you're not gonna think of Zeke like nobody's gonna think of Zeke to be there uh I I again I agree I love that he's there I love that he got a chance to ball out I don't know if he'll be there next week not not one of these guys is typically consistent uh, week to week, but there it is. You go from one, you got a good chance to at least, you know, like Mixon did. If, even if you fall, you know, you got 10 spots uh, to make it, but that is your top 10 list and running back besides Zeke. And you can still comment on Zeke, of course, what sticks out on this list for you? Well, you know, like you were talking about touchdowns and versatility and stuff like that. And, you know, like what I'm seeing here is that if you don't, have that receiving upside and you're not getting a good amount of catches as a running back, you know, this list shows again that if you want to be up there, you have to score touchdowns and probably not just one. You probably got to score two, like your Derrick Henry type of situation, right? Like if you're not scoring multiple touchdowns and you're not catching passes, you're not going to get into the top 10. And on the flip side, even if you don't score that touchdown, if you do catch a lot of passes, you know, a guy like Rashad White, who's having a great second half of this season, you know, mostly as a receiver, he's done it a couple times as a rusher as well. But you got to target those receiving backs on your draft day because they Absolutely. have so much upside when they're catching the ball that they don't need that touchdown to have a big week. Your top 10 on the season, eight of them have receiving touchdowns. Most of them, most of those eight have multiple receiving touchdowns right now. Derek Henry does not have a receiving touchdown. Tony Pollard does not have a receiving touchdown on the year. Kind of interesting. I would have thought Pollard would have had one. Um, 
not necessarily surprised about Henry, but yeah, there you go for the season. Uh, so that is your top 10 RB list. Those are the stats. That's how it breaks down. There's really only one place to go next. Let's do it. Here we go. Wide receivers. This is for the entire week 14. Some facts about wide receivers. Again, some of these are head scratchers. Six wide receivers went over 100, but only four made the top 10. Uh, I don't want to ruin it yet. We'll talk about that in a second. 20 caught touchdowns. 20 wide receivers total this week caught touchdowns. And two ran one. Both of Wide receivers that did something you're not normally supposed to do in the position, they both made the top 10 list. It happened with the quarterbacks. It happened with the running backs. It happens again with the wide receivers. There's only two rushing touchdowns from wide receivers. Both of them made the list this week. I, I can't make this stuff up, guys. 21 wide receivers had double-digit targets. 21. All right? Only 20 wide receivers even caught touchdowns. 21 had double-digit targets. Only one guy one guy was able to haul in double digit receptions that's a horrible stat that's a horrible stat if you're a wide receiver 21 of you got the ball thrown to you more than 10 times 10 or more times and only one of you only one of you was good enough to haul in double digits we'll see who that is when we hit the top 10 list as you can imagine number one in receiving yards this week ended up at wide receiver two Number one in rush yards this week ended up at wide receiver six. Number one for receptions this week ended up at wide receiver two. Wide receiver two had a big day. He had a big day. I'm surprised he wasn't number one, but he wasn't. And the receivers with the two total touchdowns, nobody had, no wide receiver had more than one receiving touchdown. Two wide receivers, those guys that ran one in, are the only ones that had two. They finished up at one. And two, versatility at your position is what the key to victory is in fantasy. The numbers don't lie. I can't make this stuff up. Let's talk about the top 10 wide receiver list this week. Adam, you needed 19.5 this week. You needed a little less. You needed a little less this week than you normally have to make the top 10 list. Only two of the wide receivers were here this week. Only two running backs repeated on the top 10 list only three quarterbacks and only two wide receivers repeated on the list it's insane uh six out of ten are here for only the second time it's been a long time since a lot of these guys have been here okay plus you got the newbies all right eight out of the ten one again six went for a hundred yards Five of those guys made the list so yards do matter a little bit more baltimore has two guys on the list That'll, key it. That'll give you some clues to who's here. Second week that Green Bay debuts a wide receiver. Watson's first time on the list last week. We got someone else's first time from Green Bay on the list this week. 57 wide receivers now made the top 10 list this season. Three newbies this week. We got three rookies to the list this week. That's a lot of rookies uh, on the top 10 list. Let's get into the top 10 list. Number 10. Michael Pittman Jr., we talked about him playing him. I did do the Minshew Pittman stack uh, and and in my DFS, Michael Pittman, number 10. Odell Beckham Jr., he's one of your newbies to the list. He shows up. It's part four. We're getting into the playoff hunt. We are getting into the must-win games. OBJ shows up and does exactly what he's supposed to do, why he is there. Ends up at number nine. Zay Flowers is your second Baltimore receiver. Is that against the defense? Is it on the offense? Was Baltimore just clicking? Probably a combination of both. Zay Flowers ends up on the list for like the second time, I think. Garrett Wilson. This is amazing. This is his first time on the list all season. He has not made the top 10 in fantasy all season until now. Here he is at number seven. Jaden Reed. There's your Green Bay debut. DeAndre Hopkins is back on the list. Cooper Cup makes a visit at number four. Told you Baltimore defense could not stop them. DJ Moore. He had a lot of uh, rushing yards and 
that that deep, deep, wide open pass uh, for a touchdown towards the uh, third quarter, I think it was. Drake London, that's your number two. That's your rush yards leader. That's your reception leader. That's the only guy that can pull in his double-digit targets. The only guy out of 21 with receivers that got double-digit targets. Drake London is the only one that can pull double-digit receptions in. He ends up at your number two. Kind of surprising he was number two with those kind of numbers. But number one. What do you got, Debo. Debo. Clues all over the board. You got the Niners field. Debo, he gets two into the end zone. He got some rushing. It, you know, catches one, rushes one. Again, versatility at the position gets you wins in fantasy. Adam, how you feeling about this list, my friend? Well, I mean, Debo has been unstoppable lately. He's on a ridiculous tear in fantasy football right now with the numbers he's putting up. Drake London, he's kind of been up and down all year, right? Like very DFS slow him, start to the season. My I knew yeah, and then he started doing great for like a little stretch, and I was getting him back into lineups. Then he completely disappeared again, and then this <laughs> week he explodes for a WR two. Um, Cooper Cup over one hundred seventy yards know. for Drake London. Over one hundred seventy yards. Yeah, yards. yeah. Yep. Unbelievable game for London. Cooper Cup finally bouncing back. It wasn't really being talked about much, I feel like, but he has been completely nothing since his first, what was it, one or two games since returning from the injury. He's basically done nothing since then. Like, he has not been Cooper Cup only a couple times. So people who have Cup were definitely happy to see him finally have a big game this week. I agree. And then, yeah, I mean, you said it with Garrett Wilson. You know, like that's an interesting one that he just made the top 10 for the first time. I mean, obviously, poor quarterback play is extremely yes. difficult to overcome for a wide receiver. Michael Pittman has been one of the most consistent fantasy football wide receivers of any wide receiver this entire season. Michael He's Pittman gets double-digit targets every single week, and he's doing a lot with them. Minshew loves Pittman. Minshew loves Pittman. He goes his way all the time. He goes his way in big spots on third downs, in the red zone, all situations. He's looking for Pittman. Pittman's been an absolute stud this year. The thing about Pittman, too, is he doesn't like, he doesn't have, he's only got four visits to the top 10 this list this year. They're both nine and 10 uh, visits. But when you talk about, you know, all of the wide receiver position, you figure in a 10 person league, you've probably got about 30 wide receivers going bump that to 36 for a 12. Cause most of them play three. Even if you're only playing two, that's 24, 24 to 36 wide receivers. So you've got a little more versatility there. What I kind of look for is above 15 points. As long as my receiver gets above 15 points with that kind of diversity, I count that as a good day uh, because of the wide receiver position, honestly, 15 points or above, you've got around 20 people. The average right now uh, is around 22, 22 wide receivers every week get above 15 points. So as I just said, you're talking 24 to 36, above 15 points. That's a good day for your wide receivers. Um, and he's gotten above 15 points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine games. Pittman has gotten you above 15 points. So he's been consistently valuable as a fantasy asset, regardless of the top 10 list. The top 10 lists are fun to play with, but I need consistency at the va- with value. And Pittman, as you said, has been one of those guys uh, that even though he doesn't make the top 10 list, he's always getting that 15 and above. That's what I need. I need those points. Uh, and he's getting them for you if you have been playing them. It's currently sits at fantasy wide receiver number 11. And again, now that we're getting into playoff season and you're talking 12 to 18, wide receivers playing every week. Number 11, that's one of the guys you want to have. Pittman Jr., there he is. Uh, Again, some interesting stats, I think, uh, facts, if you will, from the wide receiver, just across the board, I think uh, there's a lot of interesting things that we can work with uh, and talk about the positions, and we're going to uh, in this next segment called the Fantasy Pulse with a It's the Holes Check with Adam Holes. We do this every week. It's one of my favorite parts of the show. I bring it uh, to Adam, and he gives it back. He has no idea what I'm about to send his way. Uh, either of you guys, feel free to comment on what we are about to talk about. Adam, we've kind of touched on it a little bit throughout the show. Well, a lot of it, honestly. The new faces. We have three new 
quarterbacks. We had two new running backs. We had three new wide receivers. That's eight of the 30 people making the top 10 list. Eight of them were brand new to the list. QBs make sense because you got injuries. You got guys stepping up. Elliot, I think, is a benefactor of that. But why in this part four of the season, okay, that's weeks 13 through 16, the first part, part one, part two, part one, people are feeling out. Part two, part three, you saw a little more consistency. Now we're in part four, and we see guys coming out of the woodwork, guys that haven't been necessarily all season, or at least not consistently, and now here they are on the list. What, what, why are we seeing that? What, what's the fantasy relevance here? Well, I mean, injuries definitely have a lot to do with it, and you touched on it. But, you know, there's the trickle-down effect with some of the injuries as well. Right. Like when you see a backup quarterback come in, it's going to change the target hierarchy of the wide receivers because they prefer different route combinations. They have chemistry with different guys than what the starter had. So it kind of changes the entire offensive package when you have to make a change at quarterback. Or even if you have like a heavily featured running back or wide receiver that you kind of design your offense around. Everything looks different if they go out. I mean, think about the Vikings. When Justin Jefferson's in the lineup, he gets, you know, 15-plus targets a game, and everything runs through Justin Jefferson. He hadn't been there in a while, and the way they were calling plays and designing the whole offense looks completely different. You saw Alexander Madison get a bump while Justin Jefferson was out because he's getting more touches and more involvement. So injuries and the trickle-down effect definitely has a big thing. The other thing I will say is a concept that I touched on. I think it was either last week or the week before that these offenses with all these crazy wild card races and so many teams alive for veteran players and for guys that you're managing their workloads and limiting their touches throughout the year, this final phase that you've referenced several times during this show is the phase where you take all those training wheels off, you take all the restrictions off, load management is no longer a thing anymore this time of the season. You were keeping your guys fresh for this moment that if you're in a playoff race or in the playoffs, either way, at the end of the year, that your best players and your veterans and your studs are all fresh and healthy and ready to play their best football right now. To me, like, you know, one of the names that jumps out because he made the top 10 and he's a perfect example of this is Odell Beckham Jr. Yes, you know, absolutely. He was injured at the beginning of the year. And even though he was playing very limited, they were using him sparingly, not a whole lot. And now it's towards the end of the season. It was a game against his former team in the Rams that the Ravens said, all right, Odell, we're going to let you loose now and hope you stay healthy, you know, for this run. But – We've maintained you and managed you and made sure you were good to go for the end of the year because that's when we need you the most, and he responded. I've said it. I appreciate it all the time when you get a new quarterback in, hit the wide receiver two, wide receiver three. Those are the guys that the, the these backup quarterbacks get reps with. They don't get reps with wide receiver ones, uh, and, and they get few, you know, a few of them with the wide receiver two. Those wide receiver two, especially that wide receiver three guy, when a new quarterback comes in, especially for fantasy pur- purposes, go back and look. I'll run some stats for you if you want. It's 100% across the board. The new guy comes in, those two threes, they become the number ones for the first couple weeks as the, the timing gets developed between the wide receiver one and the backup uh, over a couple weeks. Uh, and you you brought up we, – we talked about it last week about the running back position, how we see this uptick in running back uh, production at the end of the year because – it's the healthy ones. It's the ones that kind of been saved. We see guys like Bijan Robinson get back on the list. We see guys um, that weren't here that haven't put together a lot of top 10 games. You see Tajay Spears end up as the number one uh, in receptions, even though he didn't make the list. James Cook back on the list. It's that saving them up for when I really need you. When I really need you. This is when I need you to show up. And I agree with you. Uh, with this one that, that that has a big thing to play in it. Um, yeah, you, you know, Bijan's a great example too. You know, like he was basically evenly splitting touches and even getting out-touched by Tyler Algier for most mm-hmm. of the year. 
these last few games, it has not been like that at all. Tyler Ogier has completely fallen off the map, and it is all B. John Robinson in that backfield lately. So you're going to see a lot of teams do that. Flip that switch now that we're not managing your load anymore. We need you to go right now. Stafford finally – Stafford put together three in a row, all right? Uh, Howell has done it, and he had more than three in a row. Uh, Hertz has done it and Allen has done it. Those are the four quarterbacks for the entire season that have been able to put three top 10 performances in a row. All right. No one else has been able to do it three in a row for the running back room. It's you've got Eckler, you've got, um, I'm sorry, ETN, you've got Kamara, uh, and a chain, a chain did it at the beginning of the season. Other than CMC, those are the only four guys that have been able to put together three in a row. No one else has been able to do it. All right, to put a top ten performance and at receivers, Hill's been doing it all year. J J Jefferson did it. JJ did it at the beginning of the year before he got hurt. Diggs did it at the beginning of the year. Lamb did it in part two of the year. Uh, part two, part three. AJ did it. Debo has now done it. They are. The only and then this week we talked about the lack of repeats. All right, nobody's repeating. Nobody's putting two weeks in a row. We only had four, uh, uh, three return quarterbacks, three uh, return wide receivers, two return running backs, whatever it was. They're not stringing them together. We're seeing guys step up. We're seeing, like you said, that diversity. What's with the lack of consistency, especially towards the end of the season, but really the entire fantasy season at every position. There's only a couple of guys that can put together two, three weeks in a row uh, for these top 10, these high performances. Well, to me, it speaks to that the level of competition in the NFL has gotten so much better in these last couple of years, in my opinion. And we're even seeing it right with the landscape of the playoff races this year, like a lot of teams now are unable to like separate themselves from the pack. Right. There's a lot of teams kind of on equal playing fields. And that's because the players are just getting so good. Also, all these rosters are good. All these teams, you know, there's a lot of teams with good quarterbacks that are on the same plane or running backs on the same plane or receiving cores on the same plane. Right. And because the talent level of these teams is really starting to level out and you're really seeing that competition level being so good across the board. There's only like a couple teams right now that are like out of the playoff race. Only a couple, mm -hmm. That's right? True. And we'll get into that. even look at like the landscape of the AFC conference right now, you know, like where's the juggernaut team? Where's the teams that are like truly separating themselves from the pack? Sure, the Ravens have been great all year, okay? But the Dolphins just lost to the Titans. The Chiefs have lost a couple of games in a row. Uh, you know, the Jaguars have lost a couple of games now. Like, these teams are all very even. And though there's division races and wild card race, they're kind of all, like, pretty close, you know? And I think because of how close these teams are competition-wise, it's because of those rosters. And we're seeing that in fantasy as well. Like, all the good guys aren't just on a handful of teams and they're dominating every single week. All these teams have guys who can make noise. It's showing up in the standings and it's showing up in the fantasy numbers. It makes it a little more difficult when you're putting together your, your playoff rosters, but there are guys that have been consistent. I just named them Hill, JJ, Diggs, uh, Lamb, AJ, Debo. Uh, you know, th there's guys, and we'll get more into that, uh, you know, probably next week. But yeah, I'll probably do that, you know, Go subscribe <laughs> to the Instagram at that effing show. You'll see information on that all week. Last question, Adam, the Kansas City penalty. All right. It takes back a touchdown that would have given Kansas City to the game. The first gripe was that Kansas City, you know, should have got a warning. They've always gotten warnings before. They never, you know, they almost never call offensive uh, offsides. Uh, uh, Tony should have checked with the ref. And you hear a lot of talk about how Kansas City is now dealing with what everybody else has to deal with. You know, Kansas City usually gets away with it, whereas the other teams get called for it. Um, and you hear all this complaining about Kansas City whining, honestly, how it came out. Why is Kansas City whining? Then we find out, the video comes out, that Tony did check with the ref. 
Now, you could argue that Tony wasn't completely set when he checked with the ref, and it was pretty good. I don't know how he even got a response back. Uh, but Tony did check with the ref. Uh, and so the numbers come out that last year, two offensive uh, offsides were called. The year before that, one offensive offside was called. This year, 11 have been called. So there's an uptick. There's more attention being paid to it. I don't know if 11 is significant in over 200 games played, but two versus last year, you know, ones and twos versus 11, I can kind of see it. The question is, there's been a lot of talk about officiating kind of for the past two seasons, a huge uptick in it this year. They should have to answer further actions at the end of the game, uh, do press conferences, um, you know, there's a lot of games that have been decided by ref calls. It The ref topic seems to be consistent every week, and it's gaining speed. What do you think about that? What are they going to do about it, if anything? Talk to me about, about the problems with refs. Is there one? Well, look, I mean, here is a big problem with the refs and with their accountability and a big reason why they don't have to answer for anything. And that's because the NFL has consistently chosen not to hire them as full-time employees. The referees, let's remember, they are a unionized group of referees that are basically on contract with the NFL, not full-time employees. So you have to remember that that's kind of a two-way street, right? So the refs kind of like make some of their own rules in a sense with stuff like you said with media availability and stuff like that. The NFL can't make them do it because that's not their employees. Coaches, players, stuff like that have media obligations as being an employee of the NFL. Technically, the refs are not employees of the NFL so, you know, that stuff's on the referee union, not on the NFL. So if you have a gripe with that, you know, like maybe it should be that can we finally get the NFL to, like, put the refs on full-time contracts because then they could have a little bit more say over some of this stuff that goes on and hold them accountable and stuff like that. I don't now, think they want that either, though. I don't think the refs would agree to that. That's what, you know, the union um, is there for. Look, money talks. Money yeah. talks. Right. You know, like I actually saw it the other day that referees make on average about 200K per year. That's yeah, like an NFL ridiculous. referee. And most right? of them are Fortune 500 company employees already. Sure. Right. These are guys who now, know people. If you're the NFL and you're saying that full time reps are going to get a bump to half a million dollars a year, that's more than doubling their yearly salary. You don't think they'd be interested in talking about something like that? Yeah, or what about $1 million per year? I mean, the NFL only makes like $100 billion a season, <laughs> right? Sure. You know, you can pay your reps a million dollars a season and everybody's happy, right? Is okay, there a problem, now, let's go back. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is what a problem? No, no, go ahead. Go, go, go to your Okay. Answer. But yeah, like going back, I was going to say, to the actual game, the actual call itself. First of all, I'm going to give credit to Peter King. Uh, he wrote about it in the Football Morning in America column that since 2019, every year before the season, you know how the referees in the NFL sends out points of emphasis to every team and things that they're going to be looking for this year more so yes. than yes. they haven't in years past? Offensive offsides has been one of them for the past few seasons. He said between 2016 and 2019, there were zero total offensive offsides called in any game during that stretch right and then you laid out the numbers over the last few seasons of what it's been so it's not like the nfl didn't warn teams that this is going to be something that they're looking for more so now than they ever have you mentioned the tony video let's be honest tony didn't really check yeah, right really check. he got yeah. up to the line he pointed at the ref and basically said i'm good you know, like he yeah. just pointed at him and then looked back at Mahomes. He didn't wait for the referee's response. Yeah. Usually yeah. the ref will give you a point or a nod or he'll like leave his hand back if you have to move back a little bit. All Tony, all Tony did was quickly just point at the referee to say, yep, I'm good. And he but was clearly all sides. It good. wasn't even close. And let's be honest here. Offsides. He was all sides. This is not a controversial call. No. He was off sides. Now, if you want to debate whether it should be called in that moment or not, that's a fair debate. You know, like you don't want the refs changing the outcome of the game. 
But this is the Chiefs we're talking about. How many times have major calls and big moments helped them win games? Because you're talking about that video that came out with Tony on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it right now. There are a whole bunch of videos circling right now of Patrick Mahomes getting calls late in game and celebrating those referee calls. And yep. now he's being a hypocrite after the game saying that calls should never decide a game, this and that. He's asking for penalties on last drives of games all the time, and as he should. I'm not saying he shouldn't do that. But if you're going to do that and want the penalties when you have, like, you know, when they work in your favor, but you can't throw penalties when it works against us, that is him being whiny. It's him being a baby. He's not used to that. He's used to it going his way. He's also not used to being on a losing streak. And he's not used to the Chiefs being relatively, I'm not going to say mediocre, but they are not better than all the other teams in the AFC like they are every season. I think he's getting frustrated. He's been on the top for a very long time. He's having a pedestrian season for his own unbelievable standards. He's usually always, you know, right in the mix for the MVP. He's nowhere near it this year. The Chiefs are not as dominant. And I think all of that just kind of came out. All of his frustrations about the season in general, he's pointing it at one call, which is not about just that call. It's not just about that call. It's everything for Patrick Mahomes piling up right now, and that was the breaking point. And, you know, I'll give a little credit to that. that you know, I think I do think it was a lot of the frustration because you can't just say that the rules only matter up until the last drive. You know, you can't just – the rules are the rules, and if you're offside, you're offside. And he was clearly offside. Like, it wasn't it, – it wasn't close. They When you look at the comparison of where the receiver is who's onsides to where Tony was offsides, it's not – it's not inches. I mean, it was – It was like a full way, yard, uh, maybe more. Yeah. It was a lot. Um, yeah. And, and so just because it's the last drive, you don't say, oh, well, the rules don't count right now because it's the last drive. And someone you – know, the rules got to count. That's what rules are for. Rules are rules all the time. Um, you know, you can't say, you know, Brady can deflate the ball, uh, you know, in the last one minute. You can't say it's okay to steal calls for the last one minute of the game. You can't do that. Um, and so I do think a lot of it's frustration, but I think that is where the frustration comes from the fans because we're not used to that from Mahomes. Um, and, and you're right. He, that's something that he needs to get used to. But even Reed and the rest of the organization, or, and, and these guys are longtime professionals, um, and, and they've had to deal with adversity. And you expect a little more maturity and able to handle the adversity. And, and we've seen him do it. We've seen everybody do it uh, because that's part of the game. You, you get the the the, the – token quotes and all that stuff you know everybody gave 100 percent. we just went out there and played as a team and, and all that and, and that's what you got to do sometimes sometimes you just got to be like ah, oh, you know that that's how it goes uh i don't know i haven't seen the tape yet i don't know if he was actually off sides obviously we're frustrated in this moment but um it doesn't change anything at the end there's just a whole lot of different ways you can handle that situation and i think that's what we expect from Mahomes. that's what he's done before he's been all class and and it's just finally you get a moment uh, where he just – the frustration got the better of him. And that's not to come down to Mahomes. That's to say he's human like everybody else. I I think Mahomes shouldn't have done it. Mahomes is in the wrong. Mahomes should admit to being in the wrong. Uh, but at the same time, you would be frustrated in that moment as well. Uh, so I'm not so mad about it. Uh, yeah, there's, there's one more quick thing, you know, kind of on that too. It's like we know Mahomes is an emotional guy. It's yeah. just that we've always seen him be super successful and his emotion comes out in the celebrations and the getting pumped up and the screaming on the sideline because it's always been in success. He's yeah. not one of those level-headed, stone-faced quarterbacks. <laughs> He's like Tom Brady in that sense that when good things happen, he gets fired up and he starts yelling and he's getting the crowd pumped up and stuff like that. We've never seen a whole bunch of adversity with Mahomes. This is adversity, and it's just saying that look like he is an emotional guy. It's just that now we're seeing it from the other ends as well. And the last point that I want to make, like Andy Reid, okay, he never, ever, ever comments or complains or does anything like this. So I want to give props to Andy Reid because, in my opinion, the only reason he's making a big stink about it right now is because of how upset his quarterback Mahomes was and the way that Mahomes reacted 
Andy Reid's just backing his guy. Yeah. You know, this is not typical. And typical Andy Reid would be like, look, like the call is the call. If we play better for the rest of the game, that call wouldn't have mattered so much. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, like the officials didn't lose the game for us. We could have played better. You know, it's our fault for leaving it in the hands of the officials. That'd be an Andy Absolutely. Reid type response. But he's like, look, Mahomes is getting all this heat for his reaction to how he handled it. Let me take some of it off him. I'll jump in there, too. I'll back my guys. So props to Andy Reid for that. And also props to Mahomes because I believe he has apologized to Josh Allen and kind of said, like, you know, Josh had nothing to do with it, and I kind of shouldn't have taken it out on Josh Allen in that little exchange. I was just upset. Yeah. Um, this is the uh, – I've been the holes check without a mole. Just nothing more to say after that. I mean, NFL writer Adam Holtz, he sums it up perfectly. Uh, thanks for doing that. Adam, he does it every week. And every week over on Fantasy Sports Corporation Network, we got a Thanksgiving one. I got to update it. I'm sorry. But the Wave the Wire show is every Tuesday at p.m. You got to go check that out to find out who you need to grab off the waiver Wire to win your playoff matchups. Wave the Wire show from TSS Fantasy on the Fantasy Sports Corporation Network channel uh let's get into this week let's talk about who you need to pick up to win those matchups uh, here we got some good games this week we got some opportunities this week uh we got a lot of teams that are playing for consolation brackets we got a lot of teams trying to win a playoff matchup and it starts on thursday with the chargers who cannot seem to win a game despite all the fantasy numbers and matchups and talent uh versus las vegas i know Chargers versus Las Vegas doesn't seem very fun to watch, but honestly, this could give some fantasy value, in my opinion, Adam. Well, I mean, the Chargers secondary has gotten torched all season long. So even though it's Aiden O'Connell, I think in your fantasy matchups, you can definitely feel comfortable with Devontae Adams. And I think you can with Jacoby Myers as well, because every receiver seems to put up numbers against the Chargers this year. Yeah, The biggest thing... I'm looking at, well, there's kind of two. For one, it's a bummer for Keenan Allen owners, right, that Easton Stick is going to start this game for their playoffs. That would make me nervous. It does make me nervous in the leagues that I have Keenan Allen because we know who he is with Justin Herbert. And I'm not saying Keenan Allen can't produce with Easton Stick. I'm sure he'll get his usual volume of targets. But how productive is their offense really going to be with Easton Stick, who looked like a disaster last week when he did come in, and against the Raiders' defense that has played really good lately, since Antonio Pierce has taken over, minus maybe the Chiefs game, the Raiders have played pretty well. So that's a concerning thing. And Josh Jacobs didn't practice first day of the week. Uh, he's dealing with, first they said it was a knee, now they're saying it's a quad. He has some kind of a leg injury going on. The big question for me is, you know, like if Zamir White starts, is he a guy that you consider for your lineups this week against that very weak Chargers defense? I mean, you kind of have to in the sense – the thing is it's the playoffs. So I don't know if you have to dig into yeah. sleepers at this point. Um, you know, you probably got your team pretty well handled. And I don't know you necessarily – you know, buys are out the window. Everybody's in. So I, if, if you made the playoffs, I don't know that you necessarily need to – I think we're past the streaming options. There might be a couple out there. Uh, I, I don't know if you need to, but maybe from a DFS format could be a great spot to get super, yeah. super value on someone that might put some points on your board so that you can grab a top guy. Uh, so maybe from a DFS standpoint, I might I might look at that for sure. Oh, yeah, let me write that down because it worked last week. I ran it down this week. Uh, that Pittman stack last week, I used it too in, uh, yeah. in in a couple of my lineups. Some, some, it depend on what you plugged in there. It could have paid off, and it couldn't, and it might not have. I had another one. I did Fields. I did not pair it with DJ Moore. Classic mistake, like absolutely horrible, and I should mm. have because um, I would have won a lot more. I paired him with Komet and said, <laughs> "Hey, there you go." Uh, Minnesota at Cincinnati. We got Saturday games this week. 
So that's kind of fun. With the lack of college football, NFL steps in, says we can make some money. We can diversify a little bit. Minnesota at Cincinnati, this actually could be a decent game. You got Dobbs versus Browning. I'm sure Dobbs is going to be back. I have no doubt about that. JJ's back. Uh, so you got uh, Jefferson versus Chase. Dobbs versus Browning. You got Mixon versus nobody. He's kind of by himself. Uh, and the lack of defenses, this could also amount to some fantasy points for you. Yeah, I mean, for me, like, I'd be a little bit concerned about Mixon this week. You know, like, if I have Mixon in my lineups, like, I'm obviously starting him. I'm not benching Mixon. But with how good Chase Brown looked last week, he looked very explosive. He has a lot of speed, and he looked really good on the touches that he got. That I'd be a little bit worried with Mixon for this playoff stretch that the rookie is going to start taking more and more touches away from him at this point after how good he looked and after the experiment kind of worked, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, he only had three touches. I don't know. I, yeah, you're. I mean, you're right. You're going to play Mixon either way, so it really doesn't matter. You're going to play Jamar Chase. You're going to play uh, Jefferson, although it didn't pay off yet. Hopefully they get some practices in. Again, the backup quarterbacks, you get a new guy in. That's why we talk about. Uh, for the Chargers, you know, maybe, maybe this is, you know, the rookie's chance to kind of step up finally uh, with a new quarterback coming in because I guarantee they got a lot of reps together. Um, for the Chargers game in, in Minnesota, uh, you've seen that. Jefferson, I don't know if you're going to get that output that you were expecting just yet. Just yet. Plus, he's got the chest injury. He's questionable anyway. Pittsburgh and Indianapolis. I actually like the Indianapolis guys for points here. Um, I know Trubisky made the top 10 this week. Uh, he could make the top 10 again, but it's just so much of a gamble. Uh, you can maybe throw in like a Warren or a Najee or something here. Uh, I, if you have to play Pickett, I got it. It's hard to not risk him, but you're definitely playing uh, Pittman Jr. for sure uh, and probably some Taylor as well. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I like the Colts guys in this matchup. Uh, the Steelers defense has not showed up this year. Now, like, for leagues that, you know, you have defenses in. You know, like, I know not all leagues play defenses anymore. But DFS Colts, has it. So we can still talk oh, yeah. defenses at DFS. Yep. So. DFS yeah. has it, as well as a lot of fantasy leagues, you still have team defenses. For me, I'm targeting Colts defense this week. Yeah, that I is can. a defense that I want for sure. They currently rank seventh in fantasy points per game. So they're already a top 10 defense in fantasy football playing against the Steelers team with Trubisky, an offense that has struggled pretty much all year with their backup quarterback who likes to turn the ball over. Give me the Colts D all day. Absolutely. That's a fantastic DFS uh, run and a fantasy run right there. Because defenses, I think, it doesn't matter what time of year, playoffs or otherwise, you're streaming defenses, at least if you're winning. Yeah. Uh, your streaming defenses. Denver at Detroit is your last one. This one is a lot more interesting than, I don't know, maybe the beginning year we thought this was interesting. As the year progressed, you wouldn't have thought this was going to be very interesting. Now that we're in this part uh, four, uh, act four of the NFL season, this Denver-Detroit game, there's a lot riding on the line for it for both teams. Um, you know, Detroit as far as being at the top, but Denver being on their streak and trying to make the playoffs, this really could be a this could be a really fun game to watch. Yeah, I mean, you know, and Russell Wilson quietly ranks in the top five in touchdowns this year. Russell Wilson, the guy who was done last year. Remember that when there was no more Russell Wilson left in Russell Wilson? Well, he's been down to neck. <laughs> now, from a fantasy perspective, you gotta love both the Lions running backs, both of them, Gibbs and Monty. The Broncos have absolutely been terrible against fantasy football running backs all season long. So Monty and Gibbs can both definitely eat. Unfortunate for Amon Ross St. Brown owners, he's going to get Sertan in this matchup. First yeah. round of the playoffs. I mean, there's no way you're ever benching Amon Ra. But this no, is I think he's still going like to do well. Yeah, like, I, I mean, really you know. Sertan has done very good against elite wide receivers. Like I'd be a little bummed out, you know, for my fantasy perspective with, with, with Amon Ra. And because of that, this could be a Sam Laporta huge game for the yes. Vikings. So I love Thank the running backs and I love Laporta for sure. Absolutely. And you can't talk about that enough about what an asset that guy has been to the, the Detroit season. You know, you weren't really high 
on the Lions at the beginning of the season when we did our game by game analysis. Uh, but there's no way you could have factored in Laporta. And I think if you had been able to factor in Laporta, I think you might have been a little more happy uh, with Detroit at the beginning of the year because he he is him. He is an actual absolute top ten, uh, or I mean, uh, elite tight end. And there's not a lot of them. He's he's definitely one of those guys. I mean, he's easily, like, next year during draft season, easily oh, yeah. going to be one of the top five tight ends to get drafted. Might even be top three. Might be. Uh, and, yes, to, to verify, it, it's true, everybody. I don't, the, speaks to the truth. Russell Wilson is tied fourth in touchdowns. Unbelievable. You would not think that. You would not. Russell Wilson. I know. Where it, he is. There he is. Chicago and Cleveland. I don't really like this one so much. Um, I, I like fields for points. I always like fields for fantasy points. Guy's kind of a fantasy points monster. Um, I think DJ Moore might get you something. I don't think he's going to be the top guy, uh, you know, in fantasy uh, this week, you know, but I think you can get points there. I don't like anything in Cleveland, uh, but maybe I'm wrong there. You tell me, Adam. No, like, I'm going to agree with you. I hate this matchup from a fantasy perspective. I see an ugly, low-scoring game. The Browns' defense struggled for a little bit. They had a good game last week in a really important win for their playoff looks, beating Jacksonville, and as you mentioned earlier, picking off Trevor Lawrence three times. So they might be back on track now. I hate this game from fantasy. Hate it. Absolutely. Tampa Bay at Green Bay. This one could actually get you some fantasy points, too. He's a... Uh, we saw Rashad White up on the top 10 list yet again. He's done, uh, you know, he's not getting the streaks because we talked about how nobody's really getting the streaks, but he's consistently up there. We talked about getting the, the 15 points to become relevant, fantasy relevant. He is definitely doing that. Um, and, you know, we saw last night, you know, what, what a running back can do to Green Bay's defense. Uh, Tampa Bay's defense can – you know, typically do enough, but they got schlacked by Desmond uh, Ritter and Drake London last uh, in week 14. So it kind of looks good for love. And I don't know which green Bay receiver considering each, each one this week, it was uh, Jane Reed last week. It was Watson the week before that it was Dobbs. So there's, I don't know if they're going through rotation or what with receivers point being, there are fantasy points to be gained here. Oh, yeah, like I'm with you on what a lot of you said. You know, and it's not just that, you know, last night seeing what can happen to Green Bay's rushing defense. It's been all season long. And by the way, all last year as well. Green Bay is awful in stopping the run. Love Rashad White this week. Um, it, this is like a great environment for fantasy, in my opinion. Because, like, yeah, like the Packers are good against the pass, but Mike Evans is good against everybody. You know, like I'm not worried about Mike Evans. Chris Godwin has already been a fade. So, like, playing a good pass defense, like, Godwin can still be a fade because, for me, he's been a fade for weeks now. And then when you look at it the other way, kind of like you mentioned, Jordan Love. Like, if I have Jordan Love, I'm starting him this week. Tampa Bay, like, they're the opposite of Green Bay, their defense. They're great against the run, awful against the pass. Green Bay is the opposite, right? So, I think Jordan Love can go off in this game against Tampa Bay. And I'm right there with you with what you said about the receivers. Like, I'm not super confident in any of them because they all kind of keep rotating around. It's Jordan Love who I love in this game. And, you know, kind of that fade, fade type situation, A.J. Dillon's another guy. I'm fading him just about every week. Like, I have no yeah. interest in A.J. Dillon. So the uh, fact that he's playing a very good rushing defense, he would have been a fade for me anyway. So this is kind of like strength versus weakness and weakness versus strength. Like, you know what I mean? Like, which yeah. is a great situation for great your guys. Fantasy. Like, I'm feeling really good about my fantasy players in this game. Yeah, Green Bay 23rd against the run, ninth against the pass. So uh, there you go. Rasheed White yep. has, has been doing very well. Uh, and he's winning your pass catching backs. We talked about versatility, being good at doing the things you're not supposed to do. Rasheed White, that's where his success has come from. Every time he's been at the top, it is because of his receptions and running the ball in. Uh, so good situation there for Rasheed White. Uh, matter of fact, I might actually white right white him down on my list. Uh, Houston at Tennessee. Tennessee stepped up against Miami last night. Uh, they got Houston, and it may be a Stroudless Houston. Uh, so that's going to hurt your wide receivers. If Stroud's back, I do like Nico Collins in this one. Um, and Brown, if Stroud's not back, I don't know if I like anybody in this game, period. 
Maybe Henry. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you. And also, look, with Nico Collins, it's if Nico Collins plays too. He came away with that last game with an injury as well, which if Nico's going to be out and Stroud's going to be in, Noah Brown is the guy that I think you have to watch. And he's a guy you can definitely plug into your lineups this week. If Stroud is playing, I'm not so interested in Noah Brown if it's Davis Mills. But if Stroud's in and Nico's out, give me Noah Brown. Yeah, I got no problem with that. I, I like Noah coming in, too. I picked him up just for that, uh, just for this little stretch here. Um, lost it. The Rams at – I'm sorry, that was last week. <laughs> the Rams at Baltimore. That was a great game. There was a lot of fantasy points there. This week, it's the Jets and Miami. This is going to be interesting. This is going to be a big one. This is going to have playoff implications 100%. Uh, the Jets' defense versus Miami's offense, who did not look amazing last night. However, um, you know, you've got S- Sauce versus Hill, um, and that opens up Waddle underneath, I think, and, and the run game underneath, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you have to, like – the Miami running backs in this one, for sure. The Jets have not been nearly as good against the run as they are against the pass. I see a run-heavy type of scheme for Mike McDaniel and the Dolphins this week. I think you can start both running backs. Achan and Moster are both good to go for fantasy this week. Um, I agree with you on Waddle. Uh, I think Waddle can get I see Waddle having a lot of targets and receptions, maybe not a ton of yards. Like I think it's going to be a lot of those quick slants and across the middle and those, you know, kind of shorter to intermediate routes for Waddle. But, hey, I mean, in PPR leagues, I'm definitely in on Waddle. For the Jets, I mean, it's really just Brees Hall for me. I mean, you know, like you're obviously putting Garrett Wilson in. He's going to get a lot of coverage uh, from Howard and from Jalen Ramsey. So he's like a guy I'm not super excited about either. But as we just kind of saw that – I lost you, Adam. We'll get Adam back in just a second. But, yeah, he brings up, the uh, you know, a great point in the fact that um, – it, uh, sorry, the Jets are actually 23rd against the run, if you believe that. That defense, as good as it's been, they're 23rd against the run. So susceptibility there, obviously, that's what, been one of Miami's strong points this season. So, yeah, Miami running backs, go ahead. Um, I like it. Uh, and I think Aaron Wilson could do well. If we get Zach Wilson that we got from last week, I, I don't know. Jalen Ramsey has been playing well, but I think Garrett Wilson is him uh, when he has someone that can throw him the ball. So I, I'm not mad. Yeah, at but I'm not counting on that same Zach Wilson to show up. You know that's, what I mean? That's like, what you like yes. All of a sudden, <laughs> after 32 starts, he has 32 starts. Like, he's not a new quarterback anymore. He started 32 games. And we think all of a sudden now he's figured it out after one really good game. And by the way, it wasn't even a really good game. It was a really good half. He didn't do anything in the first half of that game. He exploded in the second half. And I'm not taking anything away from Zach. I said that was the best game of his career. But let's temper our expectations on Zach Wilson. I expect him to go back to the Zach Wilson he's proven to be over his other 31 games. Who you guys want to play this weekend in any game, any matchup, or the ones we're talking about, you, you know, stay along with us for the whole ride. Kansas City at New England. New England's defense been tough. Kansas City's defense had been tough, uh, but they've been playing some tough teams. I don't know if New England is one of those tough teams. Zeke debuts at number one. Uh, debuts on the top ten list, hits number one overall. Um, I don't know. This one is so iffy for me that I don't want to play anybody. You're obviously playing your Kelsey, and you're never going to sit Mahomes, I guess. Um, But I don't know. I think I'm staying away from this one. I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, Kelsey and Mahomes are obvious. Uh, There's really no other chief I'm super excited about. Rashi Rice is a very borderline play this week for me, you know, with how good New England's defense can be. I know he's been good lately. But, like, ugh, you know, like, I'm not feeling great about having Rice in my lineups this week. He's also a tough guy to bench with kind of what he's done lately. And also with, I think this could be a factor as well. We have an angry, pissed off, annoyed, frustrated Patrick Mahomes coming into this game, which we don't really see ever, right? You woke up so, the wrong gentleman. You woke right, up. but what's that Mahomes going to look like? Is he going to be off enforcing it and going back to throwing interceptions because he's frustrated and pressing? 
Or is he going to absolutely explode this week for like 500 yards and five touchdowns because he's pissed off? So that's what I'm watching in this game. I can see Mahomes go over 100 yards rushing in this one. Just, just Ooh, frustration. Not, not really, but you know, I, I can see Mahomes being a rushing machine, being the leading rusher at least this week because I think he's going to want to just do it himself and just be pissed off. Him and Kelsey, uh, I think, are going to go big this week. But I'm not touching them. I mean, you, those again, those are the guys you have to play. So, well, yeah, you're playing them, but like those aren't like DFS targets. You know, like I'm not right, spending yeah, I'm not all, spending the money. on Mahomes and Kelsey this week. I'll pass on them and I'll spend my money elsewhere in more favorable types of matchups. But you could be right that uh, that they could go off in this one. You could get an angry Mahomes. I like that. Uh, Giants at New Orleans, Olave, Barkley, Kamara, and that's about it. Although, you know, I do like the Giants to possibly get the win again in this one. They've got a resurgence. They're riding a streak right now. You know, it's possible, but playing in New Orleans is a whole different beast than playing at home on Monday Night Football. It's going to be loud. That's going to be a brand new experience for a guy like Tommy DeVito. Uh, So that's an interesting one to watch to see if DeVito's for real or not. If he can go into New Orleans and get a win, we can really start talking about Tommy DeVito. Like, maybe they got something there. Maybe. Maybe Atlanta, Carolina, I, you know, normally you're not going to chase it with, uh, you know, Desmond Ritter and Drake London, fin- both finishing in the second position in the top 10 this week um, for their position. I know everybody talks about Carolina's past events, but it's really fallen off, uh, especially with the coaching change and all that. Understandably. So um, I, I actually might like Ritter and uh, Bijan this week. Definitely Drake London. Uh, I like this week. Anytime you're playing Carolina, you know, that's a favorable matchup for me, even if it is Atlanta. Gotta love Bijan this week. He's an obvious starter in season long leagues. He's a guy I'd spend up on in DFS. He's a guy I'd look for. Carolina can't stop the run. They're awful against the run. And as the season gets later and as Carolina keeps losing games, you know as well as I do, like stopping the run defensively in the NFL, a lot of it is about effort. You know, a lot of it's a mindset. Like, this team is not going to run the ball on us, right? But, like, where's the effort and motivation from a team that loses every week? And as it gets later and later, you know, there's going to be guys on that field that don't really want to be out there anymore. That they're like, look, can we just get to the offseason? Let's get this over with. I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to get hurt for this. Like Exactly. (laughs) So, I could see Dijon. But then again, beware of Arthur Smith. Because couldn't you see the storyline next week? All it the B. John owners in fantasy going back to F. Arthur Smith. He just <laughs> lost me my fantasy playoff yeah. game because he gave Tyler Algier the ball 20 times this game. Why did he do that? Would, would that shock you? Because we talked about me. using players, saving our players for when I need them. I don't know Atlanta needs Bijan to get past a, a one-win Carolina that, that's in shambles right now. So if, I, I hear what you're saying. If I don't need him, I don't might, might not necessarily use him. Uh, so I again, it could be a trap. It could be a trap, guys. Watch out. Uh, Washington at the Rams. Howell is back. I like him again for the top ten after what I saw Lamar do. Um, I like Howell in this one. I like my Rams players in this one. Kyron Williams for absolute sure. I think uh, Puka does well. I think Cooper does well. Top ten guys. I don't know. Kyron I like for the top ten this uh, next week uh, as well. Um, and Stafford. I think Stafford will do well. Uh, uh, do well again. So I like how I like Stafford. I like Kyron. Who else do you like him? Or not like? I love this game for fantasy. Like, I think yeah. this could be a high scoring fantasy matchup. I think this is a game that you can target for DFS as well. Get a couple yes. guys in there. A guy I'm going to highlight this week is actually Curtis Samuel. He's been getting a lot more targets and a lot more involved in the commander's offense. And when you go look at the numbers for the Rams defense, Their cornerbacks are very good against outside wide receivers. Where they get beat most often is in the slot. Curtis Samuel basically plays exclusively in the slot. So very favorable matchup for Samuel and a guy who's already been seeing some increased volume lately. I love Samuel as a sneaky play this week. Yeah, he's got six or, uh, excuse me, five or more targets in the last four games. They just come off the bye week. When they played Dallas, so against the top, 
top-tier defense. If they haven't really come up against top-tier defenses uh, until now, they're on a big stretch. They're going to play the Rams, who are considered a top-tier pass defense, the jo- uh, Jets, who are considered pass top-tier. San Francisco is not considered – they're not in that uh, red marker, but they're very good. And then Dallas again. Curtis Samuel got 12 targets against Dallas, uh, the only other top-tier defense. So – Look for Curtis Samuel over this stretch to kind of, you know, do exactly what Adam's saying to get an uptick in targets uh, and hopefully receptions and, and put some fantasy numbers up. San Francisco at Arizona. Love my San Francisco guys. I don't think I like anybody in Arizona. Argue with me, Adam. No, I mean, it's obvious. You obviously play all your Niners and, and I mean, who are you starting for, for the Cardinals? Yeah. Uh, Dallas at Buffalo. I like play everybody in this one. Uh, maybe not oh, yeah, Kirk. play them all. Play them all in this play one. Them play, play them all. all. It's going to be a good game, too. Uh, Baltimore at Jacksonville. I'm playing I'm playing Lamar. Uh, honestly, I again, maybe the second time I've said this this season, Zay Flowers, sure, I'll put him in. You can end up with Zay and OBJ on the top ten list both again this week. I like it. Uh, Jacksonville, I expect – better out of Jacksonville. We've seen Baltimore's defense can be, can be beat. Uh, I don't know if Jacksonville will have enough to do it. This could be an interesting matchup. Hopefully we get a healthy Trevor Lawrence, a healthier Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you on that. Like, I'm probably fading uh, the Baltimore Ravens running backs. You know, I'm probably going to stay away from that situation for now. Um, for me, the big question mark one is Zay Jones, right? Like, are you interested in starting no. Zay Jones this week? I'm well, probably just- not. <laughs> uh, but 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 he's a tricky one. He is a tricky one, and it's getting you know they're running out of options. Ridley has proven himself not to be him like they thought. He, you know he's good. He draws coverage. He's so you know, streaky. He's so, so streaky. streaky like I mean, even barely streaky. Uh, and yeah. the Monday night game, Philadelphia at Seattle. This was supposed to be a fantastic game. It may turn out to be good, but from what I've seen from both of these teams. It's kind of like who's going to struggle the least in this one? Who's actually going to live up to their potential in this one? It is in Seattle, so I think that's bad for Philadelphia. Um, But Seattle hasn't shown a lot against top-tier teams, and I think Philly is still a top-tier team, although maybe they're not as dominant as we thought they were um, in this part four of the season. And that's what we're talking about, the part one, part two, part three, versus this crucial part four. And in part four – Philadelphia has has not really shown up and been able to get it done. They've had a tough schedule, but there are games they have to win if they want to be considered a contender. Look, in Seattle on Monday Night Football, I put the Eagles on upset alert that they might lose another game this week. I, you know, like Seattle at home, Monday Night Football, obviously the Seahawks have a better chance that Geno can play. We're not sure if Geno is going to be able to play or not, so that's definitely a big thing to keep an eye on there. But for fantasy, I like this game for fantasy. You know, I like, like, I like my... Yeah, I mean, you know, that's a because of the quarterback the because diversity. the Eagles' run defense has been so good. I they like my had been so good. Receivers. But if you've got your running backs that can catch, like Pollard caught seven seven himself uh, this week. He did. I think I want to say Pollard got like seventeen. He doesn't make the top ten list. You need nineteen to make the top ten list. But Pollard had a decent day. Not necessarily as a runner, but more so as a pass catcher. We talk about these pass catching backs. Charbonnet can definitely catch a pass. Yeah, I mean, he can definitely catch a pass. I I don't know. I don't like the Seahawks running backs as much this week as maybe you do, so I think we differ on that one. Um, and then Eagles, you know, like, though I think that they can definitely lose this game with the way that they've played lately, fantasy-wise, you've got to love all your Eagles against the Seahawks. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I like AJ. I love Devonta. Devonta's really been put getting the the target rate up. Uh, you like to see him catch a couple more, but Devonta is definitely part of the game plan coming down the stretch. And it's like you talked about, you know, kind of saving these guys, saving some of these plays, saving some of the stuff for these must wins. This is a must win. It's become a must win for the Eagles. Uh, and I'm going to say keep an eye on Dallas Goddard too. This will be yes. his second game back after an injury. It's also love on a Monday, this. so we get the extra day of rest. Uh, this could be his bounce back game for sure. Love Goddard in this one. That's a fantastic yeah. point. Um, yeah, really. Yeah, one hundred percent. We got to talk about standings real quick. I know we're over time, but we got to talk about it real quick because the playoff implications are real. Um, in the AFC, you've got one ten win team. Let's go to the NFC first. Ten, NFC deserves the attention because they've got the first team in. San Francisco is in. You talk about 
which teams are actually hot. Uh, you know, Philly's a 10 win team, but they're cold right now. It's, it's San Francisco and Dallas are really the hot teams and the NFC. And then it's everybody else. Uh, Dallas, Philly, and San Francisco are all kind of fighting for that buy right now. San Francisco is in by virtue of the schedule. And then uh, Detroit's trying to hang on. Uh, they've got nine wins as well. You've got Minnesota at seven, but they have gotten really, you know, kind of cold. They, they are definitely not assured one of those spots. And I think we said six teams sitting with six wins right now. And the Giants at five, You, we talked about at the beginning of the show, this playoff race is wide open in the NFC. Um, you've got your division winners. You've got Philly. And we're going to see who fills out those last couple spots. Yeah, and I mean, it's kind of wide open in both conferences right now, right? And it's like, what's interesting for me, you know, for the NFC is that, all we talked about all year is how the NFC South is going to be a bad team that wins the NFC South, and then the rest of the division is going to have no shot. They have no shot in the wild card. Now they, like, have a chance to get three teams in. Absolutely. You know, like, the Bucks, the Falcons, the Saints might all make it at this Mathematically, point. Mathematically, it is there. It is possible. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And, and you've, got three you know, teams, you've got three teams from the West heavy. that have a shot. Uh, yeah, but and, as we know, the NFC, and we've said it all year, they're top heavy. For me, like yeah. the Cowboys, Eagles, 49ers, if one of those three teams doesn't represent the conference in the Super Bowl, like that is an absolute insanity to me. You know, like if you yeah, could get yeah. odds on that on the sports book, like if you can get one of those three to make it against the field, like you're probably getting like, a, you know, 100 to 1. It, it, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, because. Nobody else has a defense. First of all, Detroit doesn't have a defense. Minnesota doesn't have a defense. Green Bay does not have a defense. Tampa Bay does not have a defense. Atlanta, New Orleans, uh, the Rams, the Seahawks. Nobody has a defense to stop these offensive juggernauts uh, of San Francisco. San Francisco is the most complete team in the NFL right now. Dallas Cowboys are right behind them, um, and I'll argue that with anybody. Philadelphia could, but they're just not – living up to their potential they're, they're sliding back right now but they'll be fine come playoff time playoff is a whole new season but you're right it's it's those three and everybody else in the afc again the afc is even more up in the air literally every team in the afc north is in the hunt every team uh in the afc south is still mathematically in the hunt even tennessee is still mathematically in it but uh jacksonville colts and texans are definitely in the hunt the afc west Mathematically, they're all in it, but it's really Kansas City and Denver's to lose as the Chargers can't seem to win a game to save their lives, and the Raiders seem to be doing a little too late, uh, uh, too little too late. Um, so the West is Kansas City and Denver that have a shot, but the South and the North and the AFC East, you've got Miami, Buffalo, and the Jets are not mathematically out of this either. I like the Jets' chances better than Tennessee for the five win teams, but what again, what's really surprising, the North uh, and the South. They've got seven of the eight teams that legit are in the hunt for this thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the AFC, like, almost anything can happen at this point with the AFC, with how many teams are still alive, how many teams are in the race, and how bunched up all of them, and, like, just, like, within that small number. Like, the way it looks right now, I think it's going to, like, shuffle around each week, like, as this season finishes oh, out. Yes. Like, you know, check back in two weeks, and – Nothing still might be decided in two weeks. Like, you think, like, two more games, maybe one or two of those teams will kind of separate themselves from the pack? Like, I think this is going to be a dead tight race all the way to the finish in the AFC. Well, and, and you also have to consider that everybody really has uh, two divisional games at this point, for the for the most part. Um, uh, the, the the NFC West is... is um, the, the Rams only have one divisional game. Seattle's only got one divisional game left. But San Francisco, uh, counting last week, they played three of their last five against division opponents. Um, Arizona's not really in it, so I'm not going to spend too much time with them. Uh, Washington's got two divisional opponents. Philly has two divisional opponents left. Um, New England does. Everybody in, my, everybody in the AFC East, with everybody being in it right now, makes it very interesting because all four of those teams – they all play each other. They all have two divisional games. Um, so they're going to play two of the, the the other three as we finish out the season. Um, Las Vegas has to play three divisional opponents, and that means the Chargers do as well. Denver has two divisional opponents. Kansas City has two divisional opponents. And it just keeps going. Minnesota has three. Green Bay has two. Um, 
Detroit has two divisional opponents. So you're going to see this even out, like you said, over the, the next couple of weeks, you're really going to see this start to separate as these division games happen. But it's amazing as it, it's supposed to be the end of the season. Almost everybody plays a division opponent. And so that week 18 game where you normally get a lot of people sitting um, and it really doesn't matter. You're not going to have a lot going on in fantasy that week, but from a fan's perspective, now that the fantasy season is over and you kind of kick your feet up and actually enjoy the games, you're going to have a lot of games to enjoy. Cause there's going to be a lot of playoff implications there. Adam, anything as we sign out today? I mean, you know, it's something that I referenced before, and it's that, you know, these playoff races, it's like, it just speaks to the level of competition in the NFL right now. And this is what the NFL's wanted, right? More teams to be alive as long as possible, because then more games are important, more games are interesting, it increases the viewership, uh, It, you know, like it makes fantasy better, it makes watching the product better, like, I love it, you know, like with how many teams are in the mix this year and how many teams have not separated themselves from the pack. And it's also great to see that both conferences are different as well. You know, like the AFC is like this real level playing field of so many like pretty good, not elite teams. While the NFC is like, you know, your big three elites, top heavy and then rest of the pack. So it's two completely different landscapes in two different conferences as well. Uh, This has been an awesome, unpredictable season for sure. Now that we are solid into Act 4 of the NFL season, uh, fantasy implications all over the place. Playoffs are in full swing. I hope you made it. I hope you come out on top. Go back, check out the uh, for the beginning of the show. Check out all those stats. Keep following us at that effing show. Follow Adam at Adam Hole Sports to get all the stats, all the information that's really going to be relevant that you're going to need uh, to follow to get these playoff wins. It's all not as clear as it seems with the, the performers going up and down. It's a big roller coaster, but we'll help you all figure it out right here on that in morning after show and all across the fantasy sports corporation for adam holes i am chris fox we'll see you guys next week and all through the week best of luck everybody take care we'll see you next time